All right. Welcome, everybody, to Products Account uh, Austin. I'm Michael Paulson. I'm the head of the Austin chapter. And in my day job, I am the chief product officer at Jungle Scout. Uh, it is great to see some, uh, some of the same faces who've been coming and join us every month. And it's great to see a lot of new faces as well. Uh, we're also uh, lucky to have next month's speaker uh, in the audience, Nathan Yang of Poly. Nathan, uh, here we go. Give a quick wave. So uh, if you join us uh, in July, he'll be here. Uh, but first things first, before we get going, I wanted to give a big thank you to our uh, wonderful and gracious host, the Indeed team. Uh, they do all the hard work. They provide the venue, the refreshments, the audiovisual support, and, and actually all, all really all the hard work that goes into making tonight uh, fun and successful. So uh, please join me in giving them a big round of applause. Say thank you. Uh, and I, I want to invite up uh, one of the Indeed team now, Mindy Krupp. Why don't you come on up? Mindy is the product manager lead uh, on the business automation team. Uh, and we always like to have somebody from Indeed come tell us what they're working on because they're doing a lot of cool stuff. So, Mindy. Thank you. Hey, guys. Welcome. We have a really good group, it looks like, tonight. I'm excited to have you guys here in our house. We're a little spoiled here, as you can see. We have a pretty big kitchen. They feed us. We love you all. Um, our barista every morning. My husband never has to make me coffee ever again. I'm very spoiled that. Um, like Michael said, I'm Mindy. Um, I work for our business automation team, which here at Indeed, we help people get jobs. Business automation, my team supports our internal people um, build the tools that help people get jobs. Say that five times fast, I dare you. Um, so basically the big project that we have going on right now is our huge transformation from a homegrown CRM. So basically the tool that our client success and our sales reps use to interact with our customers every day, we're moving that from all homegrown over to Salesforce. So moving into the new world. So as we speak, I have 3,000 users being migrated into the system tonight. So you can see the black under my eyes, maybe a little bit, I'm just a little tired, it's happening. Um, but we're very excited. It's um, a really exciting time to be at Indeed. Um, so definitely we're always looking for people looking for a new opportunity. So come visit any of us in a badge tonight. We can talk to you about some of the other cool projects that we have going on. Um, I have one housekeeping thing. I need to let you know that this is going to be recorded tonight. So I'll give you a couple seconds if you wanna change your mind. Good, we're all safe. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Michael. Thanks again for coming, guys. Thank you, Mindy. Thanks a lot. All right, gang, so this is uh, our agenda for tonight. This is our agenda for tonight. Okay, so, so in a second, I'll introduce our speaker. Um, she's gonna talk for a little bit. At the end of that, my favorite part, we're gonna do have time for questions and discussion, which is always really interesting. And then at the end of that, we always allow about five minutes at the end for what we call shout out, sort of the, the network and community building part of the night. Um, if you are hiring, if you are looking for your co-founders, if you're raising money, if maybe you want people to demo the new product that you just launched, things like that, be thinking of what that pitch is. You will have uh, 10 seconds to make your best pitch at the end. And the first two of you will be rewarded for your bravery with this fabulous uh, Moleskin uh, notebook as well to kind of get things going. But that's a great, a great way to share with people what you're working on if you want to get people involved. Um, so uh, a few things, I think a lot of you have heard this field before, but if you were new, I want to let you know, Products Account is a community of product managers and, and design professionals who want to get together and hear from people who are working on building products at scale that, that change people's lives. Uh, it was founded in 2014 uh, by SC Mawadi. Uh, at this point, we do live events like this uh, monthly in five cities. We also have a blog and a podcast and uh, invite-only leadership series. And about 200,000 people now are involved in some way uh, in, in the community, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the video notice also, actually, that's how I uh, came across the organization. In the first place, there are some amazing videos online. And in addition to the people here tonight, I mean, you're special, you get to hear this in person, but I think this is gonna reach uh, a lot of people uh, after that as well. So um, 
We've been doing this for six months now in Austin, which makes this our half birthday, uh, which is uh, pretty cool. And I cannot think of a better way to celebrate it than with tonight's speaker, who is somebody I'm super excited to hear from. Um, Tina Wayand is Verbo's chief product officer. Get that right? They're responsible for product and design behind Verbo's global vacation rental sites, right? And this is a really fun, prolific uh, Austin brand that I'm betting that that everybody in this room has had some personal uh, positive experience with, uh, which makes it really cool. Um, Tina joined Verbo, um, formerly HomeAway, right, in 2016, after spending almost two decades in Los Angeles and Silicon Valley, where she has held uh, leadership roles at Yahoo, Ask.com, Demand Media, IAC Publishing Labs, and others. Uh, while, at, while at Yahoo, Tina has led several global product teams focused on search and display marketplaces. And at IAC Publishing, Ask.com, and Demand Media, she has helped the companies explore innovative approaches to content strategy and monetization. Um, she graduated from UCLA with honors uh, in her free time. She's a runner. She's a gardener. And she's always exploring new things. And this is where I get really jealous. She is a kite surfer and into digital painting as well. So uh, please join me in giving a really, really warm welcome to Tina Wayan to come uh, tell her story with us tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Tina. All right. Thank you, Michael. And thanks, Mindy. Um, yeah, so we chatted a couple months ago, and I actually honestly had not heard about, this is going to be precarious, but I had not heard about products that count. And when it was described to me, um, and, you know, hats off to Michael for uh, taking um, the initiative and building out this in Austin, and congratulations on number six. I mean, that that's pretty huge, and I think that um, Austin has a lot of really great product talent. Um, and it's awesome just to get together. And so it's really super inspiring. I met some great people already. Um, I have been super heads down in my job and learning the vacation rental business and the hospitality business. So I am really excited to start to surface and get to know Austin better and get to know all of you great people better. So let me just jump into um, the intro and thank you for um, setting the stage. It, I had... Um, forgotten my my background. I'm so entrenched in what's going on today. Um, but yeah, I mean, my background is marketplaces. And that's one of the things that really attracted me to um, Verbo, uh, which was the opportunity to work on marketplace again, just because of the complexity and the challenges. And um, it's I get really excited about hard problems to solve, but also because I love the space and our mission. Um, and I really like product that counts mission, which is building great products. I hope I get this right. Building great products um, to, oh, I'm testing. No, no, it's building great products to uh, change people's lives, change lives. Um, and our mission is to connect people so that they can um, have that connection and, and create relationships. So what does this have to do with using data to be customer centric? And um, this is the first time I put this presentation together and I'm certainly open to feedback after afterwards, but um, this is something I'm pretty passionate about because um, customer centric is a word that gets used a lot. Um, and data and customer centric thrown together seems a little bit strange. But I'm going to try and convince you that it does matter and to be really good product leaders and build products that are going to delight and create opportunities for your customers, um, you need to be, uh, data needs to be kind of at the, at the center of some of your strategy um, to delight customers. So we're, we're going to be a little bit um, high level and then try and get really specific with some examples that will hopefully inspire you. And I'm going to learn how to do this quicker. Where should I be pointing it? Over here? Where did you point it? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is just a slide that you can kind of see all the different groups um, while I go into a little bit of um, discussion around Verbo so that I want to give you a little bit of context, like why should you believe this person who's standing up here? Um, so uh, Verbo is a vacation rental marketplace that it's a two-sided marketplace. Um, and the reason that's important is we actually have consumers on both sides. So we have travelers who are looking to book, but we also have 
people like myself and maybe some of you who have vacation rentals that you put in the marketplace, you care deeply about these properties, um, and you have, you know, strangers who come in and have a great experience in, in the properties. So on both sides of the marketplace, we have to try and address these customer needs, and they have very, very different needs. Also, on the supply side of the marketplace, we have businesses. We have property management companies um, globally who help owners um, make money for them. And they're in, it, they're in it to make money and grow their business. And so that's also another customer segment that we work with. And I just, I love, um, I love this product. I believe in it deeply. I've used it for a couple decades. Um, it was VRBO back then. And just being able to come to work and try and make it easy so that people can take the stress out of the booking and the shopping part and spend time on the great experience they're going to have is I get super excited about it. So as a chief product officer at um, Burbo, one of the things that I have responsibility for is I have product management teams on both sides of the marketplace and the, sort of the platform piece, but I also have the design team. And I have what's called a customer insights team. And what we did is we tried to do the model that's used in some other large um, consumer companies. And we brought together market research and user research into one team. And that's really unlocked a lot of key learnings. And I'm not going to go into detail about that. I just, it's an interesting data point. Um, I also have product marketing. Um, so it's um, responsible for the strategy, for the execution, along with our great data science team um, and engineers, but then also like how do we take it to market and explain and talk about it in a way that makes sense. Um, and so I have teams um, mostly here in Austin, but we have Denver and Bellevue and then um, London and Madrid, um, Singapore, Sydney. Yes. Um, and so, uh, you know, we try and represent. And so these are pictures of everybody from all over. All right, so let's get into, okay, someone's going to help me. <laughs> Was it just not on? Okay, fancy. All right, um, also just a little bit of, a bit about scale. So we're, um, Verbo, uh, formerly HomeAway, is an Expedia Group company. And someone was asking me what that was like. And what I would say is that it's been actually very delightful in the sense that they said, how do we help you guys go faster? We don't want to get in your way. Um, but what it's also afforded is it's brought a lot of leverage to us. Um, and so we're in 190 countries, 50 websites, 23 languages. We've been able to leverage a lot of um, their NLP around localization, things like that. We have offices. Um, and then we also, uh, in addition, obviously you can read faster than I can speak. Um, we have over 2 million properties. Um, and we have, um, just imagine, we have billions of events um, and signals every every um, day that we are um, have an opportunity to learn from, and so the scale is like pretty massive. Um, and I know a lot of you have had that experience. We've been at like large global companies, and then you're also maybe at startups. And this entire presentation is for for all of those cases. And so I'm going to make that argument. So obviously, digital is ubiquitous today, and because of that. The data that you have at your um, fingertips can be massive. It can be as big and as important as you make it, and you have to be thinking about that. Um, and it's only going to grow um, exponentially because think about video. And, um, you know, picture says a thousand words, and then how do you can instrument video, and what are you going to learn from video? Um, then you have uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. And so um, I think regardless of what industry you're in, it's, it's changing the landscape because even if you're in, say, oil manufacturing, it's, a, there's so much that's digital, especially internal customers, um, for example, it's all done through digital. Um, and, you know, look at, just look at Tesla. We were just talking about Tesla earlier, and I'm madly in love with Tesla because they completely shifted the car industry from thinking about the hardware to the software. And look at how much they delight the customer and provide things customers didn't even ask for. And they're getting those signals um, and they're just doing more and more and more to the extent where people are like down, you know, having this synchronization to upload the new software and then blogging about it. Like that's crazy. Who would have ever imagined that? Um, and so just in case you don't 
believe me, let me just show you, run through some quick data points. So 90% of all the data in the world is in the last two years. Um, this is something I constantly remind our customers. Um, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data created every day. So this is just, again, going to grow more and more. And then this is a little bit mind boggling in just the quick amount of time right now, 3.8 million Google searches per minute of people asking for things. Um, and we receive, um, you know, some of that traffic as well, where people are saying, I want a vacation rental in Galveston and we can provide that offering. So we're thinking about all of these different and then voice, I mean, I didn't mention voice earlier, but voice is also a massive opportunity where it's gonna change um, the data signals. And then you've got different things. You've got payments, you've got video I mentioned, Instagram, and then of course there's always you know, Amazon, and they're actually very, very, very good at this. Um, and uh, we've talked a lot about this. There is a belief um, and that 80% of the world's internet traffic will be video by 2021. So if anyone is in branding, marketing, content strategy, or even if you're creating um, go-to-market around your product and how-to, you have to be thinking of video. Um, and it's even video within embedded in your product. And so that's, that's something that um, you have to do. So how do you, how do you, what do you do with all this data? It can be a little bit overwhelming. And what I didn't mention, as you might've noticed, is I didn't mention anything about AI or machine learning because that's table stakes. Um, and one of the things you, you need to be, uh, you know, a little bit careful about as a product manager is people, it's a, it's kind of a buzzy word. Um, it's real. Um, but, not everybody needs to have a machine learning model <laughs> for, for, you know, to do, execute some, some process. And so, but it is, it is table stakes. And so the only way you can um, create adaptive and quickly adaptive products is by having machine learning. So I'm not even actually going to talk about it. I just presume that that is one of the ways in which you are going to tap into signals and learning and have adaptable products. But when I think about platform, platform is at um, a little bit of the heart of the thinking and what makes the data light up um, and usable. And what do I mean by a platform mindset? This gets used a lot. Um, it's a couple different things. It's one at, at the fundamental level, it is about um, thinking how you are going to be data oriented and make data at the forefront of your learning, which means you need to not have technology stacks that are siloed because um, you will lose advantage. Um, if anyone, how many have been in a situation in which something has grown up organically and now they're trying to stitch together a whole bunch of different pieces and you can't move very fast and so you have to pause and then you have to invest and it's, it's worth the investment but um, you, your competitors sometimes can come in right out from under you because they've built it with a platform mindset um, from the get-go. The second, or the third thing is you have to organize. So Conway's Law, you will, if you have teams who are not set up to um, manage their destiny and, and you have that platform mindset in place, so they have the framework with which to operate, but then they can operate and go quickly, you will have full stacks and you'll have those silos built. So you have to just think about organization. Um, and that's kind of what I mean by a platform approach. And um, there is a process though that is involved um, that's connected these things. And so the way I like to think about this is first you're listening. So you're, you're thinking about who your, your customers are. And if you're doing that, then you're listening to your customers and you're thinking about what do you need to know about what they're doing. So it's not just about research and surveys, but it's also about what are they doing on your site. And if you don't have visibility into that, then it makes it very, very difficult to understand um, where you need, where you're causing pain and friction and how much it's costing you. And so you're kind of flying blind. We were talking about this earlier, um, and you're going to hear from Mixpanel a little bit later, but uh, we have cu customer segments that is hard to A-B test. Um, using a, a shopping A-B testing methodology. So how can we at least get insights in, into like what they're doing and, and have a proxy for that? Um, so you have to be thinking about how are you going to listen and get signal? And then how are you going to absorb the data um, and use it? And, and data and 
customer um, delight do go hand in hand. Um, data doesn't tell the whole story, so you have to verify. You have to verify with, with research, with surveys, with user lab studies if you can. Um, there's inexpensive ways of doing this. And then it's all about you've listened, you've um, experimented, you're looking at the data, you're experimenting again, and you're listening again, and you're repeating that cycle as fast as you possibly can. Um, and that listening can afford you insights into which you can um, identify new opportunities, whether it's product, service, or making something better. And so that's kind of what I mean about like having that platform mindset and being data centered around that. And there's a really good example. How many have read the book Smart Business? It's been around a little bit. Um, it's about Alibaba. Um, it, you know, it's, I'm sort of jealous because they started out with a, with a platform approach from the get-go. And, um, and they're just a massive company. Um, you know, they're uh, half a trillion U.S. dollars in gross sales. Um, I think in 2017, they have something called Singles Day. So it's an e-commerce, largest e-commerce retailer in the world. And they did something like 42 million calculations a minute. And when you look at, like, how many packages they deliver, it's insane. Um, but they have kind of two fundamental approaches. And I, and I kind of wrote this down because I wanted to make sure um, that I captured it um, kind of as, as they frame it. And this is a – I've read the book, and I'm reading it again. I really encourage you guys to read it. It will make you kind of rethink um, maybe how, how you uh, approach um, building out your product. Um, Network coordination. So it's a little bit what I talked about before, but they call it network coordination, which is if you have your platform in mindset in place, which means you have data that's available, it's democratized, and there is a, a framework and a rules of the road, and then you can unlock people on top to, to innovate. Um, but by breaking down the complicated business activity, and organizing within that framework, people can, I say, get shit done. They said work more effectively. Um, and then secondly, and as important, it goes hand in hand, is data intelligence. So are you as a product leader thinking about what are the capabilities um, that will allow you to effectively iterate according to, and I love this, consumer activity and response. And again, it's, it's thinking not just about um, the in-person connections or field studies, but it's like in the product. Are you thinking about what is it you need, what are the signals that you need to see in order to understand the consumer activity and the response to it? Um, so yeah, I just encourage you, they're not paying me, but it's I found it just a really good refresher actually. And it's pretty inspiring because they've, um, not only did they have their original e-commerce um, marketplace they created, but they, they realized it unlocked additional products that have created tremendous value. They figured out that for suppliers of products to be able to have enough product available on the shelf to meet the consumer demand for Singles Day in particular, they needed to loan them money. So they created a product in which they're loaning money to small businesses. Then they wanted to help consumers, especially in China. So um, there's a lot of dynamics in China that makes a lot of this possible. Um, they needed to enable consumers to be able to pay it and transact electronically. So they created Alipay. Um, and then they have a few other products that are associated with financing and banking. And now they have a social scoring service um, that they make available. I don't know. We don't know as much about that, but we know that it's used. Um, and so, like, they've just been able to take the data from that original e-commerce marketplace and see opportunity um, with that. And I've experienced that in a much um, older school way with Overture, which was the first online search marketplace. And what we saw was all these businesses spin up around us. And we just watched it and thought it was cool. <laughs> we didn't actually try and monetize it or or build it ourselves, but it's, a, it's the exact kind of same thing that, that happens. Um, and so just going back to, and I'm gonna get into some examples. Um, is it okay if I leave questions till the end? I was just on a roll, okay. Um, so just, I'm gonna get into some examples, but I do um, want it, like the starting point is, who is your audience? So who is your key customer? And I mean like the key customer, the head pin customer, because you've gotta be, 
really, really focused on meeting that you can always expand and you can find new customer segments. But if you're not going after your key customer and getting to really in their shoes and understand what their pain points are, um, you don't, you don't know what they want. And then what data is it that's interesting and that you're going to collect so that you can innovate on top. And so, um, as I mentioned before, there's a couple different ways. Um, there's something called, I think, uh, usersurvey.com, but you can also, there's much more expensive enterprise level survey, um, mechanisms. I, I'm a huge fan of field studies and doing rapid iteration and prototyping, especially in our space, like getting into the owner with their vacation rental and sitting with them as they're like going through and looking at emails and, and booking requests that are coming in. There's nothing like it, getting travelers to actually book. We even did an extensive research field study where we had bookings happen and then stays and we followed them all along the way. Um, and what I just want to say about this, um, I think that's I think that's the bulk of it. So these are some inputs in addition to your digital your digital data, and are fairly important. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into an actual example. So um, we do commercials, and commercials are fairly involved. They take months and months and months, all the way from sketch, and and there's a fairly decent investment that's involved. Um, and we try and test and learn along the way, and we're getting better at that. Since we've done this commercial, we've actually augmented um, a couple more um, test and learn steps. But with this commercial, we, we completed it, we were congratulating ourselves, um, and we put it out there, and then we put it on YouTube, and we got YouTube stats back. And YouTube stats showed that there was a point in the commercial in which there was a disengagement by the user. And that means they're not getting to the tagline, which means then they're not coming to our site and booking. And so that's a very important um, issue. And it was a, a really interesting finding. Um, and so we were trying to figure out, like, we, we figured out the when, we couldn't, we didn't know why. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play the commercial, bear with me, it's only I think 60 seconds. And I'm, I want you guys to try and see where in the commercial do you think the user, the uh, viewer would disengage, and then we'll reveal. Okay, anyone have any idea when the dog showed up? It's a good guess. Oh, interesting. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. You can't guess. You know the answer. <laughs> See how hard, like, you guys all had different answers, and none of them were the right answer. Bigger, oh, uh, no. Mm -mm. So I'm going to show you. Um, but you can imagine we're all sitting around, and uh, first of all, we didn't even know. And then we got some really interesting insights on YouTube, and then we're just, like, scratching our heads. And then we have to figure out, well, what do we do about it? Um, so... Uh, this is the YouTube, so you can see it dips at um, 18 seconds, and that's when the pacing sort of slows, and it kind of does a little bit of recovery, but it, the green line is us, and the other line is um, just regular vi uh, video discovery um, plus, or uh, organic is the blue line that goes straight across, so it's like an organic non-paid um, video and so you can see we did really well and then it just like I don't know what happened but you got it we ideally you're getting them to the end so that you get to the call to action and so what we did is we uh, applied neuroscience methods we have a, a neuroscience professor who's in our research team and hooks he wires everybody up um, so that he can measure their facial expressions which then is an indication of their um, their emotion um, and so this is the scene that made people go, ah, 
Um, and our, our testing, um, our biometric testing actually showed that they were reacting um, to it. So you can see just below that, um, it doesn't have the, there's going to be, a, uh, the, you have your gaze coherence like starts to drop and um, smiling has kind of starts started to waver. Um, and then attention, attention kind of spikes and then it just kind of checks out. And so we kind of identified that it was the, and plus then you can see we're doing eye tracking. And so everybody's very fixated on this boy's head that's about to hit the water. Um, and so uh, the, we locate the scene that we think is kind of causing the drop off. Um, we identify, so someone thought this scene was the scene. Um, we identify the scene. And you, one thing you have to remember, a lot of our demographic are women who do the booking and the shopping. Um, but we identify that this scene had really high engagement and high um, eye tracking and, and emotion. And so we caught up the um, commercial and we re reshot it. And I think we're gonna show that to you now. And you can see right here, how we're tracking along. The original version is in blue. That's why I don't know what's going on there. Um, here's the new version. This is also a shorter. You can see the orange is the new cut. So you can see there's like this range of, um, he calls it all cute and smiling. And so with the new cut commercial, we saw that it performed in the lab a lot better. And then when we then re-ran uh, re it on YouTube, it, it actually blew everything out of the water. So we were pretty happy about that. But you can see we were trying to understand like why, 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 why was it, why was it failing? And being able to quickly just do some uh, tests with some users actually probably saved us a lot of time and money and, and prevented us from maybe even scrapping the commercial altogether. So another example of, um, of platform has to do with um, something that we call virtual experience. But at, at um, Expedia Group, we're, we're actually doing what I call platform big P in that we are um, investing in building out our own chat platform um, across Expedia beca because we'll have the data and the signals across all of Expedia brands. Um, and we think for the user experience, it's really, really super important that we're close to the data, like what they're entering in, how long it takes them, and it needs to be really close to the interaction. And this isn't just for our, our travelers and for the hotel they booked or the vacation rental they booked, but with the vacation rental, it's the owner interaction as well that we connect them to and then can track so we can get kind of a 360 multi-channel view. And then also if they go to our customer service agents, it picks up from there. So we can have a much more customer um, friendly experience and also just better for our agents because they're actually much more informed because they can see that. So that was a, a very specific platform decision that we made that was kind of what I call big P platform across um, Expedia group, which is around the virtual assistant. Um, and then um, another tactic just to talk about is what we call design-led thinking. So in one of the, um, the tactics that you want to take to try and figure out what, where do you want to innovate, um, where are your customer pain points, and what are the opportunities, what are the capabilities that you can um, um, build to address them? We do something called design-led thinking, and this is a real example where we had a basically design-led thinking workshop that was massive. I think there were 200 people there. It was a little big, but it, it still kind of worked. And we got really deep into a, our, one of our customer se segments around family and groups. And what was at the core of what they were most stressed out about, and it was actually the group decision. And just the managing of the group decision was very stressful. So the person who was on the hook with booking it was on the hook with like trying to coordinate the email threads and who liked what and where and, and which one and does it have a pool and the kids and like who's going to sleep with whom and, and all this stuff. And so we actually went and started tackling this problem and built this product called Tripboards. You can go and use it now and it has comments on it. 
And the beauty of the comments is we can see exactly what they're talking about as they look at the properties, which then we can build in that full loop and give um, owners an indication of what are, what are the travelers who are shopping finding problematic about this property. So again, we're thinking of this all the way end to end. Um, I'm so jealous of the product manager working on this product. I think it's um, really super cool. And then the, the next cycle that we're doing, so we um, did the design-led thinking course, created our, you know, the listening. Research was done ahead of time, um, did the brainstorming, um, built some prototypes, took them back into the lab, found out that some of the stuff just was confusing, didn't work, went back, we iterated, iterated, and then we got, we have out, which is our uh, first um, effort, and we're working on um, more, but this is the cycle that we're using, and because we're global, we realized some of the things that we did work really well in the U.S., but not very well in Germany, for example, um, and the, the great thing is this is a globally universal, painful um, experience, which is booking group travel. And so um, this is something um, I'm really excited about called Tripboards. And um, this is an example of one of our prototypes in a lab. So one of the important pieces always on data and signals is you bring a lot of unconscious biases. And one of the things that we're really, um, we try to be really disciplined about and have peer reviews and really challenge each other if we're biased or not. This is a funny little video clip of looking at trip boards and he's not our target demographic, but we're, we brought him in because he is a potential user and we were super curious about what he would think about um, a feature within trip boards that we were creating. We're asking him a question. Uh, we left off the really funny part. Yep, okay, so there's a really funny part where we show him another capability. I think because we're, it's still in development. There's another capability and he was just like, oh yeah, I would totally do that. I would be in there right away. Cause it's so, you know, when you're on a group trip, you, the first thing you wanna know is like where, which bedroom are you gonna get? So you're racing to get there first to grab the bedroom. And we were just like, wow, this is so awesome. Um, not even in our demographic. Uh, clearly he thinks that the, which is good. I mean, he validated that we were building for our demographic, I suppose. But yet we see that we could build other capabilities for our target demographic that he could also get really excited about. And, would, and that just made it, um, pop in terms of how we would invest and prioritize. So that was pretty funny. Um, okay, so bringing this all, we're almost done, bringing this all back, anyone can do this and actually you should be doing it. Um, so these are, these are basic principles. Hopefully it wasn't too elementary. I was trying to really um, be practical about the ways in which we apply it. And it's not so much um, the details that I talked about, it's the mindset that we were taking when we were doing it and how um, we structure the product innovation around that. Um, it's not perfect. There's still a bunch of legacy that we're like going through, but we're doing it with the intention of unlocking um, value in ways that we haven't even anticipated because we're able to get that clear signal um, because planning vacation rental travel is really messy. Like um, it, it just is one of those messy things. So this is something, though, that we did um, where we were using a third party. We actually used a third party that not only did the content capture, but it also ran the, um, the consumer, the, the traveler experience. When they were looking at a property, they could see a virtual tour on some of the properties, but what they were seeing it through was um, a third party technology. We couldn't do anything about the actual experience itself. 
and we realized that um, virtual tours are just going to be everywhere. Like when you're booking large, you know, homes or even small homes and you have multiple people staying there, you really want to understand, is it safe? What's the layout? Can grandma come? How many steps are there? Is there a fence around the pool? Like it just answers so many things. And we get great feedback from travelers about how much they appreciate having this and how it helps with the decision. So we decided that we were going to do a platform strategy for virtual tours because we couldn't understand how the consumers were using the virtual tour. All those signals were going to the third party. So we had to solve a couple problems, which was how do we get started? Um, how do we partner with the content creators, convince them to let us ingest the content into our platform that we built, and then we developed um, the uh, traveler um, interactive experience. Um, so we did like, in it, like a tiny little startup. It wasn't funded with a lot of money within the company and did a proof of concept and then got partners signed up and then got adoption. And now it's, um, we're looking at hockey stick growth. Um, but the cool part is, and if you go and use this and you find a property with it, it's good. It's not as nearly as good as we want it to be, but we're in the driver's seat and we can make it better. And so if your product is like in that nascent stage, um, it is that decision from the very outset about what it is that you think you need to own from a data collection signal standpoint so that you can iterate quickly. It's not, it's okay to partner. You just, you, you want to know what their mindset is. What data are they going to give you? Um, and is it actionable? Um, so in this case, uh, just the way the industry is, um, this made a lot of sense for us and it's worked out really well in the end. So, and just bringing it all back home, um, again, it's all about the customer. It's about like getting out of their way, letting them use your product and servicing their needs. And then hopefully with your, um, you know, platform and the data that you're collecting and your um, approach, you're going to actually find new um, areas of opportunity to unlock. And that is a wrap for me. Thank you. Tina, thank you, everybody. We got, we got time for questions, and uh, I'm going to run a mic. I know you can be heard in the room, but just uh, to make sure we get on the recording, too. So if you got a question, just raise your hand. I'll run, run the mic over. Hey, Tina, this is Aaron with Ace of Old. So uh, aside from the user experience research examples that you gave, yeah. What are some examples of some really, you know, seminal pieces of information that you guys have been able to acquire just purely digitally yeah. that have transformed maybe parts of the business or maybe changed decisions that you have made? And, you know, can you just talk about those? Yeah. Um, let me think about, well, the one was the gap on the virtual tours where it just wasn't there. I would say the chat bot. Um, so one of the things that I didn't go into is um, inserting a chat mechanism between the owner and the traveler is a little touchy because owners get really upset. Um, and in the use case that we went after, um, because we wanted, to, we wanted to step through it to make sure we were doing the right thing. It had to have a high level of quality and were travelers using it? And then what are they doing? Are they... And so we have a little, was this helpful, not helpful, like in those types of signals. And so um, when we talked to owners about it, it was with some trepidation because they, they think we might screw it up and they're going to lose that great booking. Um, but what they found in the way that we um, tackled it to get to gain their trust is we just said, oh, no, no, we're just going to go after this use case where you've already given them the information. You've told them you know, what the amenities are, you've written a nice description, in, and you've gone through all this trouble, they're just simply just, do you allow pets? And it's like, you already took the trouble to say, call me if you, you know, want to bring a pet. And so we can pull that content up and answer it right away, because the travelers are expecting, and data shows, they expect, they sort of expect to engage with a virtual assistant or a chat mechanism and they want their answers answered right away. And so we're trying to bridge both those things. And so we use the data and we thought a lot about how we instrument it to turn it and give the insights to the owners 
so they can get comfortable with it. I don't know if that kind of answers your question, but that's the one that kind of comes to mind immediately. Um, but we instrument our entire shopping funnel, um, how much time they linger on photos, uh, how how many photos they look at, and that helps us then prioritize um, what photos we might show, give feedback to the owner if your photos are good or not good. So it's that full loop to try and educate owners at scale. <laughs> um, I think. Uh, um, is it like a balancing, like how, how hands-on do you want to be with the owners and um, how much feedback do you want to give them? Is yeah, that so we, uh, we actually want a lot of feedback from owners. Um, they have the most interesting properties and they care deeply about the space and are huge advocates and, you, and just with the community orientedness of it. So we have, um, I think we have four different customer advisory boards in North America, because we break them up into like manageable groups. And then we have one or two in Europe and we're gonna start one in Asia. And what we do is it's, it, the product managers basically get to sign up for slots, time, day or time slots. Um, and I think we, the, the customer advisory boards are like the, the red team, the blue team, the green team, the yellow team. Um, and they go and they show them either what we're thinking of building, they'll show them prototypes and get feedback, or we'll show them messaging. Like, here's how we're thinking of, so we did this with the chat, is we actually showed them the, um, the concept before we even launched it and got their feedback. So it's, we want it, um, um, but to my point earlier, if we can launch something, collect data, then we can actually educate them because they have a lot of assumptions and biases. And I mean, you don't, I, my, my question is more like for you giving feedback to the owners about what they can do better. Yeah. How does, how hands-on are you about that? Like, is that me something? personally? No, or, the company. Oh, uh, very hands-on. I mean, in fact, we try and give them a lot of signal. They want as much information as possible. So some ideas of what we do is we have uh, what we call win-loss cards. So um, I have a vacation rental here in Austin. Um, and I find it really fascinating. So if, if someone looked at my property and they looked at the, someone else's property and then they booked on that property, I actually can see that I lost that booking to that property. So then when our interface allows you then to see, um, well, how did, how many, what were their amenities? And we, we tick it. They like, they had a washer and dryer. I don't have a washer and dryer. And if I see that pattern over time, then I'm like, oh, well, I, you know, I might either need to lower my price or get a washer and dryer. So we try to give them as much information as possible. In fact, we've been accused of maybe being, um, giving them a little too much information in, um, and they're, they're now asking, they like the information, but they want it more synthesized. And so that's one of some of the things that we're working on. Um, but yeah, um, in, in a two-sided marketplace, you want them to have a lot of clarity about how to be successful and um, motivate them to do, you know, what you want them to do. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, Homer has had his hands up a couple times. <laughs> so um, I would think that post a feedback post -stay. Fr mm -hmm. from the guests is extremely important. Yes. But if you're like most people, you have tremendous survey fatigue. You know, every purchase on Amazon, every purchase on eBay, yeah. every everything. Yeah. Somebody wants to. Uh, get you to take a survey and invariably it'll say, oh, this will be really quick. And it's like 20 questions. Yeah. How do you entice people to take these surveys? Yeah. Uh, is there an alternative to surveys or just a different way to implement it where you have a higher um, participation rate? It's a good question. Um, we have a two-sided reviews system. Um, there's a lot of trepidation on the owners to leave a review and they don't actually understand what a blind system means um, because they're worried that if they leave a travel or negative review, then they're gonna get a negative review. And it actually hurts them more right now. Um, and, and if you think about as a traveler, how much money you're spending, if you're satisfied and you just spent $2,000 on a family vacation that you're gonna take every three years, 
they're very motivated actually to leave reviews. And I, we have a lot of opportunity to do a better job, make it easier. But what we try and capture is that first signal, like what, like the MPS signal, would you, do, would you stay this or would you refer a friend? And then if they can invest the time, it's like, well, what did you, like how did they score on cleanliness? And, and we obviously look at, at our competitors and, and um, what they're kind of honing in on as well, because we, the cognitive load is less if, um, it's sort of similar type questions. Um, and so it's just, the in, we try to incentive the owner, incentivize the owners to leave reviews because then there's, we data shows there's a like 30% more likelihood that a traveler will then leave a review because they'll reciprocate. And then the owner is collecting a volume of reviews and there's lots of um, data and, and studies out there that show that within, a, if you have a certain number of five star reviews, I think it's over 10, it, increases your likelihood of book by double digits. So we try and um, use all of that information to encourage them, but also make it as easy as possible. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you balance uh, market, uh, the, the marketplace idea with sort of what's best for owners or renters? Um, like with cleanliness, for example, yeah. you know, oh, you were rated poorly on cleanliness. Here's an ad for a maid service. Like, how do you keep that from getting too like salesy uh, in, in sort of the data that you do provide? Yeah. Um, so we actually, we have a marketplace product and engineering team that, and their job is to have balanced and fair marketplace that considers not only even the two sides of the marketplace and there are sometimes conflicting needs, but also, um, making sure that it's fair for the players so that tra you know travelers are treated um, equitably and then owners are treated equitably and then also just balancing the needs of the business too right because that can weigh in um, as well and so that's we kind of have a separation of concerns in that way and then and they make recommendations and work closely with the traveler and product experience teams about what those opportunities are um, and and in terms of the example that you're using, for the um, owners like myself, we just use what's called a feed and we make recommendations based on data. Um, for the, the more B2B um, property management companies, we have uh, you know, um, account managers that will do the heavy lifting and kind of ladder up. And we are automating more of that. But that that's kind of what we, and we also have a marketplace operations team that sits in customer experience again, to try and make sure that we're doing right by all parties? It's a good question. Yeah, yeah great job in your presentation. Um, I'm Dan from LCRA, and I have a question about a customer acquisition costs. There was a uh, oh, yeah. internet um, report from Mary Meeker today, which I kind of scanned, and she gave a cautionary tale about for these small B2B SaaS companies, it's gonna be very difficult to acquire new customers. Mm -hmm. And she encouraged a lot of free trials, freemium models, mm -hmm. which is great, but you know, then you've got you know, product qualified leads, you've gotta get them in there kicking the tires, are you giving away the farm? Yeah. So any advice you can give about, you know, y'all have great resources in to really define who you're going after. Yeah, yeah, and this is like the cold start problem. I, I think it, I mean, it depends on the competitive landscape, but um, freemium always gets gets people in the door, and you get testimonials. It's not a it's not a bad strategy. Um, in fact, if you read the Alibaba book, um, a lot of how they got started was they actually had employees, and and again, this was China, so it's just there's a little different dynamic. But they had employees put their own products up <laughs> to try and see like seed the market. And so, yeah, I think that um, getting hooked into a, a, a payment model is kind of challenging. Um, I think the good news is, is I think technology, um, some of the core technologies that create fast learning are getting are a lot cheaper. So I, I, the investment footprint is not nearly as high. So that makes freemium um, more attractive starting out. So, yeah. All right, I'm going to be selfish and okay. sneak one in. So, yeah. so uh, I was about the rebrand, right? So when I called you, you worked for HomeAway, and now yeah. you work for Verbo. Uh, and, and as I'm watching your presentation, like seeing the amount of diligence your company does on like viewership of a single commercial, 
like I've got to believe like massive data research went into the rebrand decision. So yeah. to the extent that you have insight into that, I'd love to yeah. hear like, I don't know, what, what was some of the research of the insights and also like what, what have you learned since the rebrand? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, we almost had analysis paralysis, I would say, because we are very scientific method oriented. Um, and when I talk to some design leads and agencies, they're like, we would never do that amount of testing. Um, um, you know, this is a, this is a, it's a, there's an investment in doing this. Um, and so it, it had to be pretty intentional. And we had actually a lot of logos. Um, that, um, we had kind of a problem where we needed to make a decision and we, we needed, we needed data to help us make a decision um, because it was such a big decision and, you know, there's a lot of investment behind it. Um, and it's global, and so it needed to resonate globally. And if you know the story of, of HomeAway, it was by acquisition. So we have a lot of brands um, that we're needing to address, and there's a lot of emotion behind those brands. Um, so what we did was um, we did recall, like brand, like old-fashioned brand recall type studies. So we looked at, um, we showed um, our market research person um, ran lots of lots of studies in lots of different um, countries and basically the question it was like um, fairly complex which is uh, lots of different brands some fake brands uh, logos and then they'd show them rent different sets and they would then have to do like a little game and then it was like which ones did you remember so it was just like kind of basic like that um, and that would help us get rid of ones that just didn't make it at all. Um, our big challenge was that some of the logos looked like it could be a real estate company and that didn't work. And then, um, and then the, we did it with uh, pronunciation as well. We were really worried about changing the pronunciation to Verbo um, because we did a survey and about 50% of people called it Verbo and 50% of people called it VRBO. Well, that was pretty North America. And so it was like, what does that look like as, as someone who um, speak Spanish, you know that that actually means something. Um, and we really wanted to make sure, like, would it be confusing? Like, you know, what would, and it turned out that actually Verbo worked really well in, in all markets and it was memorable. And so we had about five that we did this extensive amount of testing with. Um, and then we even tested, so if you look at the Verbo logo, um, it's the color, I should have worn my shirt. It's, it's got a, colors and lines and we uh there were two logos actually that we ended up like they both did phenomenally well and we had to decide between which two we were talking about this earlier and we were very um sort of inclusive and so we went around the room and said which one would you choose and why and um basically the product design teams just said we would choose the one that we went with because we feel it embodies like our industry of inclusivity and diversity um, multicultures traveling and um, the diversity of the homes that we have and plus our own kind of inclusive culture um, that supports innovation and scientific mindset and we really felt like it, we could play a lot with it but we had to it's bold and we thought it would inspire the company also to live up to it so a lot of um, research to get us to uh, what, what I'd consider a good problem which is really solid research that says you're not going to fail if you do either of these um, and so we went with the bold one. So we were pretty happy about that. Yeah. But Thank you. Thanks for asking. Yeah. yeah. All right. It was months yeah. of research. <laughs> yeah. Homer. On that topic, I assume yeah. HomeAway was one, also one of the competing brands. Yeah. Yep. So how did it fare compared yeah. to all the other brands? Did it come in third, fourth? Or yeah. Whatever? So I think the um, my take is that HomeAway um could be lots of different types of products um and it was more of a category name um if you understood that it meant vacation rentals homes away then it's it's kind of that category name and we wanted something that was more of like a lifestyle brand that we could fill with more things um and Hamoy felt a little bit generic and it didn't test well so it made it somewhat an easy decision all right, we got time for one more, and if no one, there we go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Good questions, um, you guys. 
You talked a lot about designing a platform um, and how you can create a circular uh, feedback process and learn about your customers and implement better uh, strategies in the future. Um, I'm curious, and I'm sure that a lot of you all have had the same experience for companies or products that are already created and they're not based yeah. around the platform model yeah. um, and they need to be shifted into um, something that gives you a little bit more signal in the dark. Um, do you have any advice for making that process any easier, the transition from a legacy yeah. <laughs> product to we one have that's- a, And we have that problem. Um, you, you have to get, and it's not trivial um, to, sh- to shift. I mean, I'd have them read the book, um, for one. I mean, you have to educate the decision makers, which is usually going to be the CEO, the CFO, and then potentially even the board, and then whoever your technology partner is as well. Um, and, and I think it's asking the questions Asking the questions, if you do the legwork on the questions you think are important, then you can look at like, how would we answer that? And then if it's like, well, that we can't, or that's really hard, as long as you're clear on those questions and how important they are, then um, it, it kind of removes it being a philosophical debate because it gets really, you know, it gets kind of real at that point, which is how are we going to do this? Um, and um, yeah, it's, that's, that's the approach to take. And, and that's kind of how we ended up embracing this in general. Yeah. But I've been there. Yeah. It's, it's, it is hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Right on. Well, Tina, I just want to say thank yeah, you again thank very you. much. I, I really enjoyed that. So big, big applause for Tina. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there is a, you know, there's a vicarious uh, learning and experience element to this that uh, is really exciting to me. It, it's great to come hear stories from people who are working on uh, really interesting, relevant problems and doing it in ways I think that we don't all necessarily get to do. And I'll say I'm super jealous of, of your research uh, team and capability. It sounds like a lot of fun. So um, the next thing we're going to do, um, just before we kind of break for drinks and networking, we're going to do shout outs. So if you have a shout out, again, if something you want to pitch, I'm going to ask you to line up right here. And while, uh, Yes. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of that, so two, two things I want to say before that. So while, while you're thinking, if you have a pitch, uh, go ahead and line up here while I'm talking. I'm, I'm buying you time with two housekeeping notes. One is uh, we try to manage this group and these speaker events like a product. So, you know, feedback from you is critically important to us. Um, and it would be a favor to me and to Tina if when you get the email in a day or so, um, please fill it out. It just takes a couple minutes. Uh, Homer, I know we all have survey fatigue, but this one is really important and near and dear to us. Um, the net promoter score, like we live and die by that uh, here. So please take a minute, fill it out. We really read it. We really care. And then secondly, we do have a special shout out. You all get 10 seconds. Um, Mixed Panel is here in the house tonight. So Barry Chester, the account director for Mixed Panel um, at I'm going to let you go last, uh, Barry, and, and you're a closer. Um, at the very end of shout outs, uh, Barry's going to come up and just talk a little bit about what they're doing. they got a great product. We use them at Jungle Scout as well, as does Tina at Home Away. So they have a, a, like a, an extra shout out at the end of the night. Then we're going to wrap this thing up and we can all hang out and have a drink and, and chat. So anybody, anybody. Yeah. All right. Oh, Barry, while they get over there, uh, stage jitters, why don't you come on up and tell us a little bit about what's going on at, uh, at Mixed Panel these days? Thanks. Here you go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll keep this short. Um, so, yeah, I'm in town. Uh, was at Verbo earlier today. We are super fortunate to uh, um, call them a customer. Tina, thank you for sharing. Um, one of the mantras, you know, over there that, um, that we kind of hear a lot is just this idea of being, um, you know, customer-centric. Uh, and data informed, and and I just love that. Um, for those of you that don't know Mixpanel, um, our mission is is really to drive the rate of innovation. Um, that's across not only our customers, um, but within our own company. And so that's kind of how we're approaching the market. Uh, we're approaching it um, by by a platform um, that we call the Innovation Loop. And so uh, if anyone is interested in understanding how we're how we're doing that, I'm happy to. Uh, you know, talk with you after this, but um, uh, really excited with the work that we're doing with um, Verbo. Um, they're, they're leveraging Mixpanel to really understand how their customers are interacting with their products, um, the different experiences, um, and in figuring out how to test and how to drive innovation. So 
Uh, if you're interested in learning more, feel free to come find me. I'm happy to chat. Cool. Thanks, Barry. I'm, I'm actually in the midst of a board meeting right now, and we are deep in parsing all the mixed panel data in preparation for that. So we kind of live and buy, die by that data loop. So you guys have a great product, and thanks for being here. So uh, if you've got nothing else, I just want to say thanks again for being here. Um, hope to see you again uh, next month. Nathan from Poly will be talking. Um, so I hope to see you back here. Otherwise, let's, uh, I think, I think uh, drinks uh, are open for another half an hour or so. Um, look forward to hanging out. Thank you very much. See you next month. Bye.